Today's lecture or talk or discussion is called Working Locally, Thinking Globally, Community Approaches to Media Activism and, Literally, um, and, and, and Literacy. Pardon me. Um, obviously, stealing that expression or borrowing that expression from one coin that I think made popular by um, David Brower in 1969 with Friends of the Earth organization, something that was co-opted by kind of progressives, you know, thinking lo globally, acting locally. And so I just changed it a bit to working locally, really finding ways within your community, not just to act and be political, but to create change through your good deeds and through your work. So a lot of what I'm talking about has to do with that. I also feel I was, I think, initially brought here because of my work with the Human Rights Film Festival, which I continued to do. Already it was kind of fun brainstorming with Ian and Danny. It's something that we, we began in Orange County at the University of California, Irvine, and since have moved to the Echo Park Film Center, which I'll talk about in a bit. But we've already started to brainstorm. We should do some screenings here, and at our facility, it would be a nice way to kind of merge, merge the energy. But the Human Rights Film Festival is such a powerful event because people come and they become politicized if they aren't already politicized through films, through documentaries predominantly. Um, it was interesting, last night, it was not part of the festival, but we do events quite often at the Echo Park Film Center, and we showed a film called Vietnam, American Holocaust that was made by a filmmaker, I believe, in Santa Monica, um, Clay Claiborne. Um, and it was, it was a very diverse crowd, and there was a young man, I think probably not more than 19 years, uh, years of age, and he talked about how he grew up in this progressive household, and his mom was always against the Vietnam War and protested against it, and he knew it was a bad thing, but he didn't really understand why. And watching this film, it drew parallels between our current administration and the war in Iraq and things in Vietnam, and for him, it opened his eyes, and he became, um, he could now articulate his thoughts and draw comparisons be between what happened um, in Vietnam and what is happening currently. So for me, that power of film to change us, to politicize us, to make us act, to make us want to act, is a very powerful vehicle. And that's something that I want to talk about um, today. Um, Danny mentioned it in the introduction. I had forgotten that I emailed it to him. But um, for years, I really felt that filmmaking was one of the most democratic art forms for the consumer. And he alluded to it in, in the introduction, meaning we all can turn on a television, we can watch a film, for the most part, right? But to make work that is socially relevant or to even have access to work is still difficult. We talk about this media revolution where computers cost less and cameras cost less, but it still costs money and you still need the resources. So with that in mind, um, I started an organization called the Echo Park Film Center. I did hand out some brochures. I didn't know how many people were going to come, so I didn't hand out enough, but there's a few left. want to walk away with something, maybe if you're close to someone that has one, you can kind of peer over their shoulder. Um, but I started this organization in 2002. Um, the Human Rights Festival started in 2001. And let me backpedal. Once again, it's not a story of my life, but I think my life is relevant to explain why we're, why we're here. Um, so I'm a filmmaker and educator and now the director of the Echo Park Film Center. Um, back to my mother and father, being raised in a progressive household from a very early age, I was working to create change. My father was someone who talked about the revolution. He was from Italy. He was gregarious and had a big, booming voice. But I think, you know, Mama was the one that was really working for change. You know, Papa fancied himself a revolutionary, but Mama was working for the UNA and homeless shelters and, and public education and libraries and was always doing good deeds. And I think growing up, my brother and I were instilled with these values. My Mama said always, you've been given so much, you need to give back to the system replenish the system was always these things that she had told us. Um, and as a kid, you know, working in soup kitchens and working in a UNICEF store as a little kid and selling things from all over the world where all the money went to UNICEF. And, you know, it became part of my life. And I think a lot of you, I'm preaching to the converted, it's, it, you live the dream, you live the progressive ideology. It's not one day a week, it's through your actions, it's through your deeds. And, and this is kind of this culture of peace we're talking about, trying to promote that um, as an ideology, as a way to live our lives. So. Um, once again, with my parents, my father passed away in 1997, and it was really touching. I was only, I've only been here for about a half an hour, but talking to this gentleman in the front, I want to say your name is Richard, I believe so, and then also John, the very nice man working on the soundboard. We just kind of chatted informally, and both of them brought up, you know, complete strangers talked about the passing of their own families, unbeknownst that I had, it was going to be part of my lecture, and what a, what a, what a powerful and, 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 and cathartic and, and devastating experience it was for them, and I don't mean to tell your personal stories to the room, but I think it's significant, right? We're all touched by people in our lives that shape our lives. So when my father passed away 10 years ago in 1997, um, I was devastated. I was working in the film industry as a filmmaker and, and doing, you know, politically active things, but not, it wasn't really a mantra. It wasn't the way I was living my life. So um, I quit my job and I lived in my van for two months. 
Um, I had to get out of Hollywood. We'll talk more about it, but sadly, this town is all about filmmaking, but not at all about filmmaking. It's largely about the product, really the commerce of film, as opposed to the storytelling and the community of film. So I was working a job I didn't love, and I, I just had to, to drop out of society. So for two months, I drifted around the United States and showed my films. Um, I brought a little gas-powered generator, and in campgrounds on the side of buildings, sometimes chased by the police, sometimes encouraged by the police, whatever the case was, I was showing films, and I was creating a dialogue with people, and it was a way for me to deal with my loss of my father. And it was magical. Like, if I was in a campground with, you know, 10 retirees in RVs, maybe they'd say, Paolo, I don't get it, but I love your spirit. Or someone else would say, I love it, I understand what you're trying to do. And to try to demystify the world of filmmaking that we all have ideas, we just need access. We need to be able to tell those stories, and this is where I'm trying to get with this, um, as far as the Echo Park Film Center and why we did these things. Um, so then my mother passed away shortly two years later, um, and that's really when kind of things skidded and I said I need to be more proactive about creating this change. So um, in, in, in her honor and her death, we started this Human Rights Film Festival in Orange County. It began at the University of California, Irvine, it was um, co-sponsored by UNA, the United Nations Association, and it was a spectacular, wonderful event. Hundreds of people came, we had lectured, we had speakers, but eventually I stole it back. And I don't mean this with any disparaging um, terms, but it became too much, once again, about the limousines, about the parties, about who's coming to the screenings, as, a, as opposed to the, the content of the films, the real dialogue. So I kind of said, listen, I'm taking this film festival back and I'm going to re reinvent it. So what, what happened was the year after the festival, I started the Echo Park Film Center. And that's really kind of the, the, the gist and the heart of, um, of this lecture. Hearing Danny quite beautifully read, it's behind you also if you missed it, the United Nations, the eight action areas for a culture of peace. This whole lecture is about a culture of peace and ways we do that. And some of them are through fostering through education. Um, another one is through access to tools and knowledge and the dissemination of information, right? So these are key things that maybe we take for granted in this country, but things that really um, are relevant throughout the world. So the Echo Park Film Center started in, um, in like I said, the year after the, the Human Rights Festival in 2002. And the premise was simple, to create a community access center that was a safe haven for the community of Echo Park. I mean, it's, in some ways, we were joking about it, it feels like two worlds, Santa Monica and, 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 and Echo Park and the kind of east side of Los Angeles. But I had been living there for a number of years, and um, I guess 10 years now. So after being there for a few years, there was, a, there was something that drew me to Echo Park. Diane is a dear friend of mine and a, a Latina with a heart of gold, and we would joke about it, Italianos and Mexicanos, um, the, the spirit of family, the celebration of place. Um, and Echo Park it resonated with me, you know, the culture of, of you know, Catholicism and, and, and people coming together and really walking down the streets and being in the park and celebrating community and not driving to a place and locking themselves indoors, really being part of an extended family. So it seemed like the most appropriate place to open the center. And from day one, we did three things. And now after six years, going on our seventh year, hopefully we're doing them well. Um, we do free, thank you, we do free um, film and video classes, film and video making classes for youth and for seniors. So we've taught over 400 kids in the last six years and about 80 seniors, meaning not high school seniors, those in the, in the yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, and it's a volunteer endeavor, you know, it's one of these things that we've felt there was a need. There was a need for access, a need for storytelling. So a group of us that were activists, that were filmmakers, that were educators said, let's create this safe haven. Um, we're not the first to do it, but um, our model is a bit unique because besides the school, which is free for young and, and I hate to say old, but the, you know, older, twilight of their life, whatever the term we like to use, we also offer um, very low cost classes, $40, $50 for adults. Because once again, it's about access, right? So if you, you know, you're selling fruit on the side of the road or you work as an insurance broker, once again, this idea we all have ideas of films, we just need the access and the tutelage and the encouragement and the passion to say you can do it. So we've taught hundreds of adults also that have gone on to make films, um, many of them very progressive, you know, anti-war films and films about affordable housing and, you know, um, getting on your bike and riding down the street instead of driving your car and other films that maybe are more kind of, uh, you know, playful and other things, but once again, giving this voice. So the school's a big part of it. We also created a cinema, 